The Lancashire Witches chapter 9 whizzed wall hall shortly before 10 o'clock a numerous cortege consisting of a troop of horse in their full equipment, a band of archers with their bows over their shoulders, and a long train of barefoot monks who had been permitted to attend set out from the abbey. Behind them came a varlet with a paper mitre on his head and a lavern crozier in his hand covered with a circlet on which was emblazoned but torn and reversed the arms of Hazlu Argent, a vest between three mullets, a sable pierced of the a crescent of difference. After him came another varlet bearing a banner on which was painted a grotesque figure in a half military, half monastic garb representing the Earl of Poverty with this distich beneath it. Priest and warrior, rich and poor, he shall be hanged at his own door. On reaching Warley, every door was found closed and every window shut so that the spectacle was lost on the inhabitants. And after a brief halt, the cavalcade set out for Wind's Wall Hall. Strong from an ancient family residing in the neighbourhood of Warley, Abbot Paslew was the second son son of Francis Haslew of Windswall Hall, a great gloomy stone mansion situated at the foot of the southwestern side of Hendel Hill, where his brother Francis still resided. Of a cold and courteous character, Francis Haslew, second of the name, held aloof from the insurrection, and when his brother was arrested, he wholly abandoned him. Still, the owner of Windswall had not altogether escaped suspicion, and it was probably as much with the view of degrading him as of adding to the abbot's punishment that the latter was taken to Hall on the morning of his execution. Be this as it may, the court Toiled thither through roads, bad in the best of seasons, but now, since the heavy rain, scarcely passable, and it arrived there in about half an hour and drew up on the broad green lawn. Window and door of the hall were closed, nor smoke issued from the heavy pile of chimneys, and to all outward seeming, the place was utterly deserted. In answer to inquiries, it appeared that Francis Paslew had parted for Northumberland on the previous day, taking all his household with him. In earlier years, a quarrel having occurred between the haughty abbot and the churlish Francis, the brothers rarely met when it chanced that John Paslew had seldom visited the place of his birth of late. So lying so near to the abbey, and indeed forming part of its ancient dependencies, it was sad to view it now, and yet the house, gloomy as it was, recalled seasons with which so they might awake and regret no guilty associations were connected from this half painful, half pleasurable retrospect. He was aroused by the loud blast of a trumpet thrice blown. A recapitulation of his offences, together with his sentence, was read by a herald, after which the reverse blazonry was fastened upon the door of the Hall. Just below a stone escutcheon on which was carved the arms of the family, while the paper mitre was torn and trampled underfoot, the laven crossier broken in twain, and the scroll banner hacked in pieces. While this degrading act was formed, a man in a miller's white garb with a hood drawn over his face forced his way towards the tumbrel, and while the attention of the guard was otherwise engaged, whispered in Paslu's ear, He and failed I may seem further abbot, for rest assured in avenge you. Dem de shan ha me sheffield whistle. I his heart, therefore, is a day older. The wizard has a charm against steel, my son, and indeed is proof against all weapons forged by men, Clyde Haslow, who recognised the voice of Howland Absent, hoped by this assertion to divert him from his purpose. Ha, say your soul, favour, Abbot, cried Hal, then, and reached him with some sacred, and he disappeared. At this moment, word was given to return, and in half an hour, the cavalcade arrived at Abbey in the same order it had left it. Though the rain had ceased, heavy clouds still hung over it threatening another deluge, and the aspect of the abbey remained gloomy as ever. The bell continued tall, drums were beaten, trumpets sounded from the outer and inner gateway, and from the free quadrangle. The cavalcade drew up in front of the great northern entrance, and on its return being announced within, two other captives were brought forth, each fastening upon a hurdle, harnessed to a stout horse. They looked dead already, so ghastly was the you of their cheeks. The abbot's turn came next. Another hurdle was brought forward, and Demdi advanced to the tumbrel, but Paslu recoiled from his touch and sprang to the ground unaided. He was then laid on his back on the hurdle, and his hands and feet were bound fast with ropes to the twisted timbers. While this painful task was roughly performed by the wizard's two ill-favoured assistants, a crowd of rustics who looked on murmured and exhibited such strong tokens of displeasure that guard thought he prudent to keep them off with their halberds. But when all was done, Demdi motioned to the man standing behind him to advance, and the person who who was wrapped in a rusty claw, complied, drew forth an infant, and held it in such a way that the abbot could see it. Paslu understood what it meant, but he uttered not a word. Then deep and knelt down beside him, as if ascertaining the security of the cords, and whispered in his ear, Recall thy maledition, and my dagger shall save thee from the last indignity. Never, replied Paslu. The curse is irrevocable, but I would not call it by As I have said, thy child should be a witch, and the mother of witches. All shall be swept off all. Hell's torments seize thee, cried the wizard. 
furiously. Nay, thou hast done thy worst me, join Paslu, me, play. thou canst not harm me beyond the grave. Look to thyself, oh, even as thou speakest, thy child is taken from thee. And so it was, while Demdi knelt inside Paslu, a hand was put forth, and before the man who had custody of the infant prevented, his little charge was snatched from him. This the abbot saw, though the wizard perceived it not. The latter instantly sprang to his feet. Where is the child? He demanded of the fellow in the rusted cloak. It was taken from me by yon tall man who is disappearing through the gateway, replied the other in great trepidation. Ha ha, here, exclaimed MD, regarding the dark figure with a look of despair. It is gone from me forever. I forever, echoed Abbot solemnly. But revenge is still left me. Revenge, cried MD, with an infuriated gesture. Then glut thyself with it speedily, replied the Abbot, for thy time here is short. I can not if it be, replied MD. I shall live long enough if I survive thee. Chapter 10. The Hall Houses. At this moment, the blast of a trumpet sounded from the gateway, and the Earl of Derby, with the Sheriff on his right hand, and Ashton on the left, and mounted on a richly comparisoned charger, rode forth. He was preceded by four javelin men, followed by two heralds in their tabards, two doleful tolling bells, two solemn music, plaintive hymn chanted by monks to roll of mushroom at intervals. The sad cottage set forth loud cries from the bystanders, marked his departure, and some of them followed it, but many turned away, unable to endure the sight of horror about to ensue. Amongst those who went on was Hallam Naps, but he took care to keep out of the way of the guard, though he was little likely to be recognised owing to his disguise. Despite the miserable state of the weather, a great multitude was assembled at the place of execution, and they watched the approaching cavalcade with moody curiosity. To prevent disturbance, art viziers were stationed in parties here and there, and a clear course for the courtier was preserved by two lines of halberdiers with cross pikes. At length, the cavalcade reached its destination. Then the crowd struggled forward and settled into a dense, compact ring round the circular railing enclosing the place of execution within which were drawn all the Earl of Derby, the Sheriff Ashton, and the principal gentlemen, together with MD and his assistant. The guard formed in a circle, three deep round them. Paslu was first unloosed, and when he stood up, he found Father Smith, the late prior, beside him, and tenderly embraced him. Be of good courage, Father Robert, said the prior. A few moments, and you will be numbered with just. My hope is in the infinite mercy of heaven, Father, replied Paslu, sighing deeply. Pray for me at the last. Doubt it not, returned the prior fervently. I will pray for you now. Ever. Meanwhile, the bonds of two captives were unfastened, but they were found wholly unable to stand without support. A lofty ladder had been placed against the central scaffold, and all this empty, having cast off his ottoman, mounted and adjusted the rope, his tall gaunt figure, fully displayed in his tight fitting regard, made him look like a hideous scarecrow. His appearance was greeted by the mob with a perfect hurricane of indignant outcries and yell, but he heeded them not, but calmly pursued his task. Above him, wheeled the two ravens, and who had never quitted the place since daybreak, uttering their discordant cries. When all was done, he described a few steps, and taking a black hood from his girdle to place over the head of his victim, called out in a voice which had little human in its tone, I wait for you, John Paslu. Are you ready, Paslu? demanded the Earl Derby. I am, my lord, replied the abbot, and embracing the prior for the last time, he added, Veil, carissimi, frater, in atonum, veil, et dominus, ticum sit in multi onum, inimi, corum, Nostrorum, it is the king's pleasure that you say not a word in your justification to the mob, Paslu, observed the earl. I had no such intention, my lord, replied the abbot. Then tarry no longer, said the earl. If you need aid, you shall have it. I require none, replied Paslu resolutely. With this, he mounted the ladder with as much firmness and dignity as if ascending the steps of a tribune. Hitherto, nothing but yells and angry outcries had stunned the ears of the lookers on, and several missiles had been hurled at MD, some of which took their door without occasioning him discomfiture. But when the abbot appeared above the heads of the guard, the tumult instantly subsided, and profound silence ensued. Not a breath was drawn by the spectators. The ravens alone continued their ominous croaking. Hal or Nabs, who stood on the outskirts of the ring, saw thus far, but he could bear it no longer, and rushed down the hill. Just as he reached the level ground, a cold verin was fired from the gateway, and the next moment a loud wailing Burst in from the mortal that the abbot was launching into eternity. How would not look back but went slowly on, and presently afterwards other horrid sounds dined in his ears, telling that all was over. When the two other sufferers, sickened and faint, he leaned.
leaned against a wall for how long he continued to see knew not, but he heard the cavalcade coming down the hill and saw the Earl of Derby and his attendants ride past. Glancing towards the place of execution, Hal then perceived that the abbot had been cut down and rousing himself he joined the crowd now rushing towards the gate and ascertained that the body of Hasloo was to be taken to the Covenant Church and deposited there till orders were to be given respecting its interment. He learned also that the removal of the corpse was entrusted to them die, fired by this intelligence and suddenly conceiving a wild project of vengeance founded upon what he had heard from the abbot of the wizard being proof against weapons forged by men. He hurried to the church, entered it, the door being thrown open and rushing up to the gallery contrived to get out through a window upon the top of the porch where he secreted himself behind the great stone statue of St. Gregory. The information he had obtained proved correct. He along a mournful train approached church and a bio was set down before the porch. A black hood covered the face of the dead but the vestments showed that it was the body of Hasloo. At the head of the bearers was MD and when the body was set down he advanced towards it and removing the hood gazed at the livid and distorted features. At length I am fully avenged he said and Abbot Hasloo also cried a voice above him. The MD looked up but the look was his last for the ponderous statue of St. Gregory de Novere launched from his pedestal, fell upon his head and crushed him to the ground. A mangled and breathless mass was taken from beneath the image, and the hands and visage of Hazlu were found, spotted with blood dashed with gory carcass. The author of the wizard's destruction was suspected, but never found, nor was it positively known who had done the deeds till years after, when Hal and Nabs, who meanwhile had married pretty Dorothy Croft and had been blessed by numerous offspring in the Union, made his last confession, and then he exhibited no remarkable or becoming penitence for the act neither was he refused absolution. Thus it came to pass that the abbot and his enemy perished together. The mutilated remains of the wizard were placed in a shell and huddled into the grave where his wife had that morning been laid, but no prayer was said over him, and the superstitious believed that the body was carried off that very night by the find and taken to a witch's sabbath in the ruined tower on Rimington Moor. Certain it was that the unhallowed grave was disturbed. The body of Hasloo was decently interred in the north aisle of the parish church of Warley beneath a stone with a gothic cross sculptured upon it, bearing the piteous inscription, Misery me, but in the belief of the vulgar, the abbot did not rest tranquilly. But many years afterwards, a white-robed monistic figure was seen to flit along the cloisters, pass out at the gate, and disappear with a wailing cry over the whole houses. And the same ghostly figure was often seen to glide through the corridor in the abbot's lodging and vanish at the door of the chamber leading to the little oratory. Thus, Wally Abbey was supposed to be haunted, and few liked to wander through its deserted cloisters or ruined church after dark. The abbot's tragic end was thus recorded. Johannes Haslow, Capitali Avetus, Supplicio, 12 Mendes Marti, 1537. As to the infant upon whom the abbot's malediction fell, it was reserved for the dark destinies shadowed for in the dread anathema he had uttered to the development of which the tragic drama about follow is devoted, and to which the fate of Abbot Haslow forms a necessary and fitting prologue. Thus far, the veil of the future may be drawn aside that infant Anna Progeny became the Lancashire Witches. Book of the First, Alison Device, Chapter. What the May Queen. On a May Day in the early part of the 17th century, and a most lovely May Day too, admirably adapted to usher in the merriest month of the year and seemingly made expressly for the occasion, a wake was held at Warley to which all the neighbouring country folk resorted, and indeed many of the gentry as well, for in the good old times when England was still Merry England, a wake had attractions for all classes alike, and especially in Lancashire, for with pride I speak it, there were no lads who in running, vaulting, wrestling, dancing, or in any other manly exercise could compare with the Lancashire lads in archery above all, none could match them, for were not their ancestors the stout bowmen and billmen whose cloth yard shafts and trenchant weapons won the day at Flodden, and were they not the true sons of their fathers, and then I speak it with yet great pride, there were a few, if any, lasses who could compare in comeliness with the rosy cheek, dark haired, bright eyed lasses of Lancashire. Not only was John Laws of Dragon full of the checkers, and the swan also, and the roadside alehouse to Sir Ralph Ashton had several guests at the Abbey, and others were expected in the course of the day, while Dr. Omerud had friends staying with him at the vicarage. Soon after midnight on the morning of the festival, many young people of the village of both sexes had arisen, and to the sound of horn had repaired to the neighbouring woods, and they gathered a vast stock of green boughs and flowering branches of the sweetly perfumed hawthorn, wild rose, and honeysuckle, with baskets of violets, cowslips, primroses, bluebells, and other wild flowers, and returning in the same order, they went for fashion the branches into green bowers within the churchyard or round about the main hall set up on the green. They decorated them afterwards with garlands and crowns of flowers. This morning ceremonial ought to have been performed without wetting the feet, for though some pains were taken in the matter, few could achieve the difficult task 
except those carried over the dewy grass by their lusty swains. On the day before the rushes had been gathered and the rush cart piled, shapes trimmed and adorned by those experienced in the task, and it was one requiring both taste and skill. As will be seen, with the cart itself shall for while others had borrowed for its adornment from the abbey and elsewhere silver tankards, drinking cups, spoons, ladles, brooches, watches, chains, and bracelets, so as to make an imposing show. Day was ushered in by a merry peal of bells from the tower of the old parish church, and the ringers practised all kinds of joyous changes during the morning, and fired many a clanging volley. The whole village was early astir, and as these were times when good hours were kept, and as early rising is a famous sharpener of appetite, especially when attended with exercise, so an hour before noon the rustics one and all sat down to dinner, the strangers being entertained by their friends, and if they had no friends throwing themselves upon the general hospitality. Soon after midday, and when the bells began to peal merrily again, for even ringers must recruit themselves at a small cottage in the outskirts of the village, and close to Calder, whose water swept past the trimly kept garden attached to it, two young girls were employed in attiring a bird who was to represent Maid Merion, or Queen of the May, in the pageant then about to ensure, and certainly by sovereignty and prescriptive right of beauty, no one better deserved the high title and distinction conferred upon her than this fair girl. Slight and fragile, her figure was of such just proportion that every movement and gesture had an indescribable charm. The most courtly dame might have envied her fine and taper fingers, and fancied she could improve them by protecting them against the sun, or by rendering them snowy white with haste or cosmetic. But this was questionable. Nothing certainly could improve the small and finely shirt angles so well displayed in the red hose and smart little yellow buskin fringe in gold, a stomacher of scarlet cloth braided with yellow lace in crossbars confined a slender waist. A robe was of carnation coloured silk with wide sleeves, and the gold fringed shirt concentered only a little below the knee, like the dress of a modern Swiss peasant, so as to reveal the exquisite symmetry of her limbs. Over all she wore a circle of azure silk lined with white and edged with gold. In her left hand she held a red pink as an emblem of the season. So enchanting was her appearance altogether, so fresh the character of her beauty, so bright the bloom that dyed her lovely cheeks that she might have been taken for a sonification of May herself. She was indeed in the very May of life, the mingling of spring and summer in the womanhood, and the tender blue eyes bright and clear as diamonds of purest water, the soft regular features and the merry mouth whose ruddy partly lips ever and anon displayed two rows of pearls, completed a similitude to the attributes of the jocund mum. Her handmaidens, both of whom were simple girls, and though not destitute of some pretensions to beauty themselves, in no wise to be compared with her, were at the moment employed in knotting the ribbons in her hair, and adjusting the azure circle. Attentively watching these proceedings, sat on a stool, placed in a corner, a little girl, some nine or ten years old, with a basket of flowers on her knee. The child was very diminutive, even for her age, and her smallness was increased by personal deformity, occasioned by contraction of the chest and spinal curvature, which raised her back above her shoulders, but her features were sharp and cunning, indeed almost malignant, and there was a singular and unpleasant look about the eyes, which were not placed evenly in the head. Altogether she had a strange old-fashioned look, and from her habitual bitterness of speech, as well as from her vindictive character, which young as she was, had been displayed with some effect on more than one occasion. She was no great favourite with anyone. It was curious now to watch the eager and envious interest she took in the progress of her sister's adornment, plus such was the degree of relationship in which she stood to the May Queen, and when the circle was finally adjusted and the last ribbon tied, she broke forth, having hitherto preserved a sullen silence. Weal, sister Alison, ye may apparently May Queen, I must say, she observed spitefully, but to my mind others mostly or oh, Nancy old here would ha look prettier. Na na that we should join one of the damsels of virtue. There is no lass in Lancashire to old condom near Alison device. Fight upon ye for an ill favour, means Janet cried Nancy Hall, you're jealous of your pretty sister. Jealous cried Janet Redden and why the fire up should I be jealous, thou saucy jade? One I grow older, I may be prettier. May queen then only on you, and so the lads all tell me. And so you will, Janet said Alison Device, checking by a gentle look, the jeering laugh in which Nancy seemed disposed to indulge. So you will, my pretty little sister, she added, kissing her, and I will tire you as well and as careful as Susan and Nancy have just tired me. Mayhap a Shanna live till then, rejoined Janet peevishly, and when I'm dead I'm gone, I'm laid in cold church 
God, and they win me sorry for having words in me sore. I have never intentionally vexed you, Janet, or said Alison, and I am sure these two girls will be dealing. A we may allowance for her few tempers, observed Susan Walsley, for we know that ailments and deformities are sure to make war dreadful. A there it is, cried Janet sharply. My high shoulders and small sides are always round my face, but I grow tall at time and get straight, get straighter than your ski with your broad back and short neck. But if you don't mean what matters it, it shall be feared at only race. A feared wenches by ye both, and I doubt on the little good for nothing piece of mischief, muttered Susan. What's that you're saying, Suke? cried Janet, whose quick ears had caught the words. Take care what you do to offend me, lass, she added, shaking her thin fingers, armed with talon-like claws, threateningly at her, or I ask my granddame mother them die to quieten you. At the mention of his name, a sudden shade came over Susan's countenance, changing colour and slightly trembling. She turned away from the child who noticing the effect of a threat, not pressed her triumphal. Again, Alison paused. Do not be alarmed, Susan, she said. My grandmother will never harm you. I am sure, indeed, she will never harm anyone. And do not heed what little Janna says, for she is not aware of the effect of her own words, or of the injury that mine do our grandmother if repeated. I do not wish to repeat them, or to think of them, sobbed Susan. That's good, that's kind of you, Susan, replied Alison, taking her hand. Do not be cross anymore, Janna. You see, you have made her weak. I'm glad on it, joined the little girl, laughing. Let her cry on. It'll do her good, and teach her to mend her manners, and not offend me again. I didn't mean to offend you, Janna, sobbed Susan. Oh, you're so riven and marred. A body can and speak please you. Well, if you confess your fault, I'm satisfied, replied the little girl. Oh, let it be a lesson to you, so care to you. Keep guard for your tongue, a future. It shall, I promise you, replied Susan, drying her eyes. At this moment, the door opened, and a woman entered from an inner room. Having a high crowned, conical shaped hat on her head, and broad white pinners over her cheeks. Her dress was a dark red camlet with high heeled shoes. She stopped slightly, and being rather lame, supported herself on a little handle stick. In age, she might be between. 1450, but she looked much older, and her features were not at all prepossessing from a hooked nose and chin. While their sinister effect was increased by a formation of the eyes similar to that in Janet, only more strongly noticeable in her case. This woman was Elizabeth Device, widow of John Device, about whose death there was a mystery to be inquired into hereafter. A mother of Alison and Janet saw how she came to have a daughter so unlike herself in all respects as woman no one could conceive, but so it was. So you had done Giovanni at last. Alison said Elizabeth, your brother Jem had just run up to say that the rush car is set out and that Robin Hood and his merry men are coming for their queen, and their queen is quite ready for them, replied Alison, moving towards the door. Nay, let's have a look at you first, wench, cried Elizabeth, saying her. Fine fitters may find birds, they warrant me now, getting these mere gigars on your fancy yourself, queen in harness. A queen of a day, mother, a queen of a little village festival, nothing more, replied Alison. Or if I were a queen in right earnest, or even a great lady. What would you do? demanded Elizabeth Device sourly. I'd make you rich mother and build you a grand house to live in, replied Alison. Grander than Brawlsholm or Downham or Middleton. Pity you're not a queen then, Alison, replied Elizabeth, relaxing her harsh features into a wintry smile. What would you do for me, Alison, if you were a queen? asked little Janet, looking up at her. Why, let me see, was the reply, and indulge every one of your whims and wishes. You should only need ask to have poor poor. You never content her, observed Elizabeth testily. It's not your way to try and contend me, mother, even when you might be joining Janet, who, if she loved few people, would her mother least of all, and never lost an opportunity of testifying her dislike to her. Oh, dull haunty little wasp, cried her mother. No deserves no but what does, and get often enough good women you. Hanny told us what you do for yourself. You were a great lady, Alison, it was Susan. Oh, I haven't thought about myself, replied the other, laughing. A can tell me what she do, Suki, replied little Janet, knowingly. She'd marry Master Richard Asherton or Middleton. Janet exclaimed Alison, blushing crimson. It's true, replied the little girl. You know you would, Alison. Look at her face, she added with a sweet in the life. How Titong little play, cried Elizabeth, wrapping her nose with her stick, and behave thyself, or thou shanning go out to wake. Janet dealt her mother a bitterly vindictive look. She neither utterly cried nor made remark. In the momentary silence that ensured a black jingling of bells was heard, accompanied by the merry sound of tabor and pipe. Ah, here come the 
Rose Hart and the Morris and Sid Allison rushing joyously to the window, which being left partly open admitted the scent of the woodbine and eglantine by which it was overgrown, as well as the humming sound of the bees by which the flowers were invaded. Almost immediately afterwards, the volley troop, like a band of masquiers, approaching the cottage and drew up before it while the jingling of bells ceasing at the same moment told that the rush cart had stopped likewise. Chief amongst the party was Robin Hood, clad in a suit of Lincoln Green with a sheaf of arrows in his back, a bugle dangling from his baldric, bow in his hand, and a broad leaved green hat on his head, looped up on one side and decorated with a heron's feather. The hero of Sherwood was personated by a tall, well limbered fellow to him, being really a forester of all, and the character was natural. Beside him stood a very different figure, a jovial friar with shaven crown, rubicund cheeks, full throat, and mighty haunch covered by a russet habit and girded in by a red cord decorated with golden twists and tassels. He wore red hose and sandal shoon and carried in his girdle a wallet to contain a roast cap and a neat tongue or any other daintly given him. Friar Trove, or such he was, found his representative in Ned Huddleston, porter at the Abbey, who, as the largest and stoutest man in the village, was chosen on that account to depart. Next to him came a character of no little importance, and upon whom much of the mirth of the pagan depended, and this devolved upon the village cobbler, Jack Robbie, a dappy little fella who fitted part of the ghoul to a nasty. With a bauble in his hand and blue cotton hood adorned with long white asses, ears on head with jerking of green striped with yellow, all the different colours, the left leg being yellow with a red pantofle, and the right blue terminated with a yellow shoe, with bells hung upon various parts of his motley attire so that he could not move without producing a jingling sound. Jack Robbie looked wonderful indeed and was constantly dancing about and dealing a blow with his bauble. Next came Will Scarlet, Suckerlet, and Little John, all proper men and tall, attired in Lincoln Green like Robin Hood, and similarly equipped. After this came the Maypole, not the tall ball so called, and which was already planted in the green, but a stout staff elevated some six feet above the head of the bearer, with a coronal of flowers atop and four long garlands hanging down, each held by a Morris dancer. Then came the May Queen's gentleman usher, a fantastic personage in habiliments of blue guarded with white and holding a long willow wand in his hand. After the usher came the main troop of Morris dancers, and the men attired in a graceful costume, which set off their light active figures to advantage, consisting of a slash jerkin of black and white velvet, with cut sleeves left open to reveal the snowy shirt beneath white hose, and shoes of black Spanish leather with large roses. Ribbons were everywhere in their dresses, ribbons and tinsel adorned their caps, ribbons crossed their holes, and ribbons were tied around their arms. In either hand they held a long white handkerchief knotted with ribbons. The female Morris dancers were habited in white decorated like the dresses of the men. They had ribbons and wreaths of flowers round their heads, bows in their hair and their hands long white knotted kerchiefs. In the rear of the performers to the pageant came the rush cart, drawn by a team of eight stout horses with their manes and tails tied with ribbons. Their collars fringed with red and yellow worsted and hung with bells which jingled blithely at every movement and their heads decked with flowers. This year true, having come to a halt before the cottage, a gentleman usher entered it and tapping against the inner door with his wand took off his hat as soon as it was opened and bowing deferentially to the ground said he was come to invite the Queen of May to join the pageant and that it only awaited her presence to proceed to the green. Having delivered his speech in as good set phrase as he could command and being the parish clerk and schoolmaster to boot Samson Harrow by name he was somewhat more polished than the rest of the hands and having moreover received a gracious response from the May Queen who condescendingly replied that she was quite ready to accompany him. He took her hand and led her ceremoniously to the door, whither they were followed by the others. Loud was the shout that greeted Alison's appearance, and tremendous was the pushing to obtain a sight of her, and so much was she abased by the enthusiastic greeting, which was wholly unexpected on her part, that she would have drawn back again if it had been possible. But the usher led her forward, and Robin Hood and the foresters, having bent the knee before her, the hobbyos began to curve it anew among the spectators, and tread on their toes. The fools wrapped their knuckles with a bauble, the pipe to the play, the taborer to beat his tambourine, and the Morris dancers to toss their kerchiefs over their heads. Thus the pageant being put in motion, the rush cart began to roll on, its horses' bells jingling merrily, and the spectators cheering lustily.